What do you want of me? There are times that we as parents can be driven to distraction by the sometimes well-meaning flood tide of demands and expectations that are presented to us by our children, younger children, adult children as well. I want this. I need that. A snack. A ride to a soccer game. The emergency purchase of school supplies that actually ran out two weeks ago to have a serious, meaningful conversation about what they should do with the rest of their lives and to have that conversation right now, to hear them moan about a social malfunction, to hear them, but God forbid not to offer a suggestion or two, to proofread a paper and then to discover they really didn't want us to proofread that paper, they want us to rewrite that paper, to hear them out as to why they didn't get a coveted job, a coveted promotion, or why they weren't named to a a first-string team. If we're new at the game and try to offer thoughtful bits of acquired wisdom, we can suffer a sharp rebuke. In response, I have heard myself say, and maybe you've heard yourselves also say, okay, I get it. But what is it that you really want from me? What do you really want? It helps to know what people really want from us. It is far too easy to fail if we are clueless as to what the needs and expectations of the other happen to be. And by the way, if that other is God, then the stakes are startlingly Hi. Shabbat shalom, my friends. Our sedra is Truma, beginning with Exodus 25.1. God says to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me Truma, gifts, v'asuli mikdash v'shachamti betocham, and make for me a mikdash, a sanctuary, so that I may dwell among them. Throughout the Bible, God is constantly making demands of us. Make a sanctuary for me and keep the Sabbath and make priestly garments. By the way, the details given in the text regarding the making of the Mishkan occupy almost as much space as the entire telling of the story of the Exodus itself. God really wants that Mishkan. But wait, in Deuteronomy we read, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? In the same breath, Moses quickly answers to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience, to walk in obedience to God, to love God, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commandments and decrees that I am giving you this day for your own good. Great. So what God really wants is for us to revere and to love God. Okay, we can handle that. We only knew that God wants us to love the Holy One with all of our heart, soul, and might. Okay, that fits. Wait, the prophet Micah has another take on what God wants of us. And what does the eternal God require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Now, that's really confusing. Whatever happened to the tabernacle? Well, actually, God wants us to be a kingdom of priests and a holy people. You shall be holy. For I, the eternal, your God, am holy. Also, God wants us to remember. Also, God wants us to observe. God wants us to care for the widow, the orphan, the stranger. God wants us to stay away from cheeseburgers and that lobster roll. Forget jealousy and envy. Banish hatred and scorn. Annul the desire for revenge, as well as any openness to sin. And in the book of Joshua, we read, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it, all the obligations. The 11th century Jewish scholar, Bachya ibn Pakuda, tried to put all of God's demands and expectations into some kind of an order in a book that's called Chovot Levavot, obligations of the heart. God wants us to protect the divine unity, to serve and to trust God, to act with humility 
and to be open for repentance. Oh, and did I forget? We have to love our neighbor. Can we be honest here, just among ourselves? If the answer to our challenge to God, what is it that you really want from me, is an ever-changing, ever-evolving, close to endless litany of obligations, then that answer is just about the same as no answer at all. You know that the 613 mitzvot or commandments in the Torah are just the beginning. There are literally thousands, thousands of commandments called midrabanan that are ordained by the rabbis over the centuries, including such simple things as lighting a Hanukkah and Hanukkah. And still there is so much missing in those long lists of God's demands. Where are we? Where are the opportunities for us to exercise our own spiritual and moral muscles? Where is our autonomy? Since the lists were created over a period of several thousand years, how do we handle the inconsistencies, the omissions, the contradictions in those lists that were simply bound to be present, to be sides? Could anyone in a moment of quiet reflection ever not conclude that such growing lists of demands are more than just a little bit of a burden? If the answer to what do you want of me is all of the above, then we must acknowledge that there is no answer at all. Jewish scholars over the centuries have tried to trim back those answers. Let's forget the laws regarding sacrifices and forget most of the laws regarding agriculture and don't worry too much about those laws forbidding idolatry. We haven't bowed down to worship a tree in quite a while anyway. But it seems that the more that we trim back, the faster the growth of obligations seems to become. We're going to stop here. Go to the second part. Thanks for your patience.